Besides being a longtime community leader, Aaron Dixon is all, also a very spiritual and thoughtful person. Um, he was, he's been an organizer, obviously, as I mentioned before, with the Black Panther Party, who for a number of years have supported and put together a community clinic, led free breakfast programs for central area youth, organized against police brutality, among other things. Um, the Black Panther Party is, is an amazing model of the organizing that some of us are trying to strive and recreate here when we have an, a war coming, or a, you know, a presumed war coming with Iraq. Um, so we have a lot to learn from Aaron. Um, because he's one of the true leaders left, um, and we're blessed to have him here with us tonight. So it's my privilege and honor to introduce um, the community leader, a spiritual man, and a humble man. Please give a warm welcome to Aaron Dixon. 35 years ago, um, when I was coming along, a lot of my peers, we were into uh, to, uh, poetry. You know, a lot of us were writing poetry. We were writing poetry about what was going on in our community. We were writing poetry about what was going on in our families. We were writing poetry about uh, the racism that existed in America and what was going on in the civil rights movement. And so we were very much involved in, 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 uh, in, in the spoken word and poetry. And it, it served us in terms of helping us to uh, understand uh, what we were about and helping us to educate our peers. Growing up in the 60s was, was uh, both a uh, wonderful experience and also a very uh, uh, devastating experience in many ways because my generation was a generation that witnessed uh, uh, political assassinations. Almost There were six political assassinations from 1961 to 1968. And these political assassinations helped to uh, shape our, our mind and helped to shape our consciousness, just as the Civil Rights Movement helped to shape our minds and shape, shape our consciousness. Also, what was going on in, in our communities and what was going on in our, with our parents, what was going with, with, on with our families, the contradictions that existed, those also helped to shape us, uh, shape our consciousness. But there was, there was one significant element that really helped to uh, shape uh, and wake up a lot of young people. That was the Vietnam War, which had started in 1965. And it, it continued through 66, 67, as more people began to come home in body bags and, and the media began to uh, show more what was really happening uh, in, in the Vietnam War, War. More and more young people began to get turned on and tuned in to why it was important to stop that war. In the uh, black community, there was another war. There was a war of police brutality. There was a war of racism. There was a war of trying to uh, keep black people down and murder black people. And that's where the Black Panther Party came about. And the Black Panther Party was uh, started by Huey P. Newton and Bobby Seale, who were both in their, in their uh, mid-20s. And uh, uh, the, the Black Panther Party eventually became an organization of young people. I first joined the Black Panther Party when I was 19 years old, along with a lot of other people. And what, what pushed me to join in the Black Panther Party was the uh, murder of uh, Martin Luther King. And I had the opportunity of marching with Martin Luther King when he came to uh, Seattle. And, and I, 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 was, I really believed in the civil rights movement. I really believed that Martin Luther King was one of the greatest men that ever lived in this country. And when he was assassinated, that changed my, my thinking in many ways in terms of, of the strategy that we should take. And I didn't realize at the time, but thousands of other kids, young people all across the country, it changed their minds also. And we decided, we realized that we had to do something else. We had to make a, 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 a heavier impact. And so we began to search and look. For a, for a vehicle that we could ride to, uh, to victory, to changing America. And that vehicle happened to be the Black Panther Party. It happened to be there right at the perfect time for us to, uh, to ride that vehicle and begin the movement to change America. And so being in the Black Panther Party was, 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 was exuberant, it was dangerous. Uh, because we, were, we realized that uh, the only way to stop police brutality was to confront police. And so we had to arm ourselves. We had to learn about how to handle weapons. We had to learn about the laws of the police. And uh, 
as 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 most young people we we were fearless we didn't care about our lives we didn't care about dying the only thing that we concerned ourselves with was making sure that justice was done that justice would be taken care of and the black panther party uh the, the purpose of the Black Panther Party uh, was to change America, was to create a place for all human beings in America, was to, uh, uh, we used to say to create a new man, but for me to say create a new man is not appropriate in this day and age, but we want to create n new human beings. We want to create a more conscious human being today. And so we set out on, on this journey to really change America. We, we were very idealistic in many ways, but we were certain that we were going to have victory and we weren't going to take anything uh, else but victory. And so uh, as we began to move forward, the uh, government began to move against us. And I never will forget in 1969, the summer of 1969, when J. Edgar Hoover and Attorney General John Mitchell at the time and President Richard Nixon uh, called a, a press conference and said that the Black Panther Party was the number one threat to the security of America. And so with that announcement of that press conference, they began to unprecedented attack on the Black Panther Party to, to destroy uh, members of the Black Panther Party and to destroy the organization of the Black Panther Party. So uh, you have to understand that the Black Panther Party went through different phases. We went through at least three different phases that were very important to the organization. And one significant thing, important thing about the Black Panther Party was that we were required to read and study. And just so fortunately, our leader was a philosopher, a philosopher who had read a lot of different books, who had a broad understanding of the world and, and, and the spiritual world. And so uh, he uh, uh, made it uh, his, his purpose to expose us to a lot of different readings and to so that we could expand our minds and so that we could not just be in one narrow framework that, that we could have a broad uh, framework in which to work from. So those first couple of years it was about ending police brutality and it was about letting police know that there was a it was a new day uh, and there was a new organization in town and we were not going to tolerate any more police brutality and uh, actually that kind of began to happen <coughs> when the uh, Watts riot occurred in 1965. And uh, in that Watts riot, there, that lasted for almost a week. There were uh, millions and millions of dollars in damage done. There were 50, 55 or so people that were killed in that riot. But what happened with the riot in 1965 in Watts, California, was that it set the example for the rest of the country. Now, in the Black Panther Party, we always said that a riot was nonproductive, and so our job was always to try to prevent riots. But this was before the Black Panther Party had started. And so, uh, from 1965 on to 1968, in almost every major city in America, there was a major rebellion, a major riot, where people young people and, and people were getting tired of the oppression of the, uh, of the police and were getting tired of the racism and began to uh, vent their anger and their frustration in these riots. And the most uh, significant riot was in Detroit uh, in 19, uh, I believe it was 1968. And uh, that riot lasted for almost, uh, almost uh, three weeks. They had to bring in the National Guard to quell that riot down. And the rioters, the snipers, had actually taken over uh, parts of the city, and they had to call in the uh, National Guard. So um, as the Black Panther Party began to move forward, we realized that one of the things that we needed to do was to organize the community and help the community in terms of the issues that they were dealing with. So we began to put together uh, what we call survival programs. And in 1969, we organized the first free breakfast program in Oakland, California. And within a matter of months, we had free breakfast programs all across the, uh, all across the country. Uh, Chicago, they were feeding uh, almost 5,000 kids a day. In Seattle, we were feeding about 500 kids a day. In LA, they were feeding thousands of kids. In New York, they were feeding thousands of kids. And what was so significant about the free breakfast program and a lot of the other programs uh, that I'll talk about later on 
is number one, we accepted no government funding for our programs because that was one of the rules in the Black Panther Party. No Black Panther Party chapter, branch, or member could accept any government funds. <coughs> the other significant thing about the uh, breakfast program is that the majority of the people that were involved in the Black Panther Party and running a lot of these programs were, guess what, young people from the ages of 14 to 18 years old. Matter of fact, the sister that, uh, oper that was over the National Breakfast Program was a, a young woman named Marshall, uh, Marcia Taylor, who had gone to Berkeley High School and, and had graduated as an honor student, was the top of her class. And as soon as she graduated, she came right into the Black Panther Party. And she was so dynamite, she was so dynamic, she was so bad that at 16 years old, they appointed her as the national coordinator of the Free Breakfast Program. And Marsha, not only was, was she a hell of an organizer, but she, was, she could shoot better than most, most of the men in the organization. So they had her on security. She was a bad sister. And I just wanted to talk about Marsha, Marsha for a minute because uh, uh, Marsha uh, committed suicide uh, uh, probably about four years later. Um, so uh, when we began to implement these, uh, these survival programs, particularly the breakfast program, then the uh, power structure really began to come down on us. And uh, uh, w one, of the, one of the things that happened was in 1969, December of 1969, and I, I will never forget that day. That, that day is, is, is in my mind forever. And, that, and did I say December 6th? I meant to say December 4th, I'm sorry. December 4th. Uh, there was a young man in Chicago named Fred Hampton, and I had the opportunity to meet Fred Hampton. I had the opportunity to speak on the same platform that Fred Hampton spoke on in, at Chicago University. Chica uh, Fred Hampton joined the Black Panther Party when he was 19 years old. He had, prior to that, he had been a member of the NAACP, and uh, he had gotten arrested uh, because uh, he had saw an ice cream truck and there were a bunch of little kids, little black kids that ran up to the ice cream truck and they wanted ice cream but they didn't have any money. So the ice cream man wouldn't sell them any. So Fred Hampton beat the ice cream man up, took the ice cream and gave it to all the kids. <laughs> <laughs> That's the kind of brother Fred Hampton was. Then he heard about the Black Panther Party and he joined the Black Panther Party, him and Bobby Rush. And they began to organize in Chicago. Now Chicago had uh, the largest gangs in America, the Blackstone Rangers and the Black Gangster Disciples, the largest gangs in America. The, and, the, and those gangs had been around since the 30s. Fred Hampton went down to the Blackstone Rangers and the Black Gangster Disciples and told them that if they didn't stop killing each other, that they were going to have to deal with the Black Panther Party. And one of them pulled out a, 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 a revolver and started playing with it. Fred Hampton snapped his fingers at the van that was waiting for him, and about six Panthers got out with uh, shotguns. And those, uh, those gang members understood that these brothers were for real. And so the Blackstone Rangers changed their name to the Black Peastone Nation. It became a political organization and began to work with the Black Panther Party. Uh, about a year later, uh, uh, Armory got uh, uh, looted and robbed in Chicago, and, and, and the Black Peastone Nation was suspected of ar uh, robbing that armory. The other significant thing that Fred Hampton did was he began to go down to the poor white community where, uh, where a lot of uh, poor whites had migrated into Chicago from the Appalachians. He began to go down and work with them and talk with them and organize with them. He went to the Puerto Rican community where there was a, uh, a Puerto Rican gang called the Young Lords and began to uh, work with Cha Cha Jimenez and began to organize with them. And, uh, very shortly, they uh, organized the first Rainbow Coalition. It was Fred Hampton, 20 years old, that organized the first Rainbow Coalition. And Chicago, I don't know if any of you know about Chicago, but Chicago probably has one of the most uh, corrupt political systems in, in America. And at that time, the uh, mayor of Chicago was Mayor Daley, who had been in office longer than any other mayor in America. There's a book about Mayor Daley. It's, I can't remember the name about it. It's, it's called some, The Emperor or something. But Mayor Daley really was an emperor. And uh, at, when Fred Hampton began to organize the Rainbow Coalition and began to organize those gangs and got the gangs and stopped killing each other, Fred Hampton became the number one threat to Mayor Daley. Not only was he a threat to Mayor Daley, but he was also a threat to J. Edgar Hoover. 
And J. Edgar Hoover was good friends with Mayor Daley. So uh, they infiltrated the Black Panther Party quite heavily. And in Chicago, uh, Fred Hampton's security head was an uh, FBI informant. And so one night, uh, while there were about uh, 20 Panthers at Fred Hampton's house meeting, uh, because in the Black Panther Party, we worked seven days a week. We didn't take any time off. We didn't, we didn't have no, no re day of relaxation. And we worked from 6 o'clock until 2 o'clock in the morning the next day. Um, so that night, uh, Fred Hampton was meeting with some of the captains from Peoria, Illinois, and some of the captains in, in the uh, Chicago chapter. Uh, his FBI informant put some second on Fred Hampton's drink. <clears throat> and uh, that night, <clears throat> 4 o'clock in the morning, there was a knock on the door. It was ATF. And a young man named, I uh, can't remember his name, Mark, Mark uh, he was captain of the Peoria, Illinois. He went to the door and, and said, who is it? And the shot rang out, went through the door, and killed him instantly. Uh, Twenty ATF and Chicago police officers burst through the back door with machine guns. They ran into the living room. There were about 15 Panthers laying on the forest floor asleep. They, they got them up, lined them against the wall, machine gunned them against the wall. They went into Fred Hampton's bedroom. Fred Hampton was laying in the bed asleep. His, his wife was six months pregnant. She shook him, tried to wake him up, and he had been drugged. Fred Hampton could not wake up. She saw the uh, police lower their machine guns, and she just rolled out the bed. And they shot Fred Hampton about 50 times as he lay asleep in his bed. That's how afraid of a young man, they were so afraid of this 20-year-old young man, 21-year-old at that time, that they would machine gun him while he was sleeping in his bed. <coughs> I never will forget the call that I got from Central Headquarters. I was at the uh, Seattle office when I got that call uh, from National Headquarters uh, that, they, that Fred Hampton had been killed. And I, I was so angry and so hurt and so painful because I met Fred Hampton. And everybody who met Fred Hampton, anybody who knew Fred Hampton, they knew, they had the feeling that this was the next great leader. He was the next Martin Luther King, the next Malcolm X, all rolled into one. He was a humble, wonderful human being. Fred Hampton worked so hard, he was so dedicated to the people, so dedicated to the struggle, that the comrades in Chicago actually had to tie him down to a chair in order to rest. They had to tie him down to a chair. <clears throat> One day, uh, Fred Hampton uh, was uh, 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 accosted by a Chicago police officer, and Fred Hampton uh, proceeded to uh, beat the police officer up and uh, handcuffed him to a fire hydrant and, and took his gun and called the police and told him to come get him. <laughs> That's Fred Hampton. <clears throat> One, uh, one day also, uh, the Chicago police uh, made an attempted raid on the Chicago office, and the uh, police, the, the community came out and, and began to, uh, came out with arms and came out to protect the Chicago office. And Bobby Seale always used to tell us, we know when you're doing your job when the community comes out to protect you. And so Fred Hampton and the other Chicago Panthers were definitely doing their job. Now, two days later, December 6th, the ATF goes to uh, Los Angeles, and they go to Los Angeles with the purpose of killing the leaders of the Los Angeles chapter, Geronimo Pratt and other leaders of the Chicago uh, Los Angeles chapter. But the LA chapter was a very military-minded chapter. They had quite a few Vietnam vets in the uh, LA chapter, and uh, the LA Police Department was no different than it is now. It was probably much worse then than it is now. It was all, back then it was considered the most fascist police department in the world, the most military-minded police department in the world. And it was di very difficult for Panthers to even walk down the street in L.A. If you were a Panther, you could not walk down the street by yourself in L.A. because you would be kidnapped by the police. There are oftentimes many L.A. Panthers have been kidnapped, put in the trunk, and taken out somewhere and beaten up or some never even heard from again. So it was a very difficult situation being in L.A. So on December 6, the uh, pigs uh, went to uh, uh, Geronimo's house and they machine gunned the entire house. Uh, if anybody had been standing up, if anybody had been sitting up, they would have been dead. Automatically, they would have been dead. Then they went to Central Headquarters in L.A. 
and uh, and they cordoned off the whole neighborhood for about two block radius. They made people get out of their houses and just took over people's houses and, and just completely blocked off the entire area so nobody could get in and nobody could, could get out. And they went in and uh, began to broke down the door to uh, the uh, L.A. office, and they went through the door. But when they went through the door, they had a hell of a surprise for them because the L.A. Panthers had built a bunker inside the office. A bunker, if many of you don't know what a bunker is, a bunker is like a barricade, sandbag barricade that you use to hide behind and to defend yourself from behind. They had built this uh, bunker inside their office. Not only that, they had taken the chairs and the tables and they put them at the entrance of the door on both sides of the door. So when they, when the, uh, the, the, uh, the uh, uh, what, what do they call it? The uh, tactical squad burst through the door with their uh, M16s. Usually they like to go to the left. You see them on TV, how they be showing them. They be looking all cool and everything. They burst through the door. They go to the left. They go to the right. Well, they burst through this door. They couldn't go to the left. They couldn't go to the right because they had this barricades all around them. All they could do was see this bunker in front of them, and the L.A. Panthers opened up on them and blew them right out the door. And they had a shootout that lasted for eight hours. Eight hours. There were three Panthers that were wounded. There was a Panther sister that was in there with holding the M14, blasting away. She got shot in both legs. And so when dawn came and the people were out, the people were out, uh, they put up the white flag and they surrendered. And they surrendered. And all 18 of them were arrested and charged with attempted murder. Now, how can you be charged with attempted murder for defending yourself? It's ludicrous. It's crazy. Uh, several of the brothers that had been wounded uh, were not even taken to the hospital. They were taken straight to jail. But the uh, comrades performed surgery uh, in the jail and took the bullets out in jail. That's, that's, that's how we were in the Black Panther Party. You know, whatever we had to do, we, we did it. Um, the, this, this, this episode in terms of, uh, of, of the raids of the Black Panther Party continued throughout the whole country, Chicago, New York, L.A., uh, Seattle, uh, New Haven. Um, all, all the leaders of most of the chapters and branches were imprisoned from 1969 to about 1975. And uh, we spent a lot of our resources trying to bail people out. So as we began to move forward in our struggle, we began to realize that we had to change our tactics. And we, we began to realize that the uniform that we wore and uh, the offices that we had, that we had to change it. We had to open up community centers and we had to become more entrenched in the community because we had separated ourselves from the community uh, too much because we were walking around with army fatigues on and combat boots and leather jackets and oftentimes carrying rifles and shotguns and spouting a lot of revolutionary rhetoric and uh, we kind of isolated ourselves from the people. So we decided to take off our leather jackets, take off our fatigues and our combat boots and our berets and put our guns away, not too far away, uh, <coughs> and began to open up community centers right in the heart of the community, right in the middle of the community. We got rid of the storefront offices and we opened up we, we got houses and, and, and opened a community center so that people in the community could come into our communities. And we began to uh, start free food programs and giving away free food. And we opened up a free medical clinics all across the country. We opened up our free medical clinic here in Seattle in uh, 1969. Um, and I'm, I'm proud to say that that medical clinic is still open to this day. We opened up a uh, free liberation school because at that time during the summer, there were no uh, uh, day, day camps or daycare centers that people could, poor people could send their kids to. So we said, hey, there's a void here. These, pa these parents don't have anything to do with their kids, so hey, we're going to put together a liberation school. And so it was a, it was a full scale daycare, uh, uh, day center program for young people. <coughs> Um, we provided breakfast and lunch. We picked them up. We dropped them off. We took them on field trips. We talk about, talk, taught them about the Vietnam War. We taught them about who Huey Newton was, who Mao Zedong was, who Ho Chi Minh was. And we had these liberation schools all across the country. Uh, Chuck D. from Public Enemy was uh, one of the young people that uh, was in our liberation schools back in New York. 
We organized free busting the prisons program. We organized free pest program. We organized ambulance program. Whatever we saw was not happening in our community. Wherever we saw that there was a void in our community, where, whatever city we were in, we created a program to support the people in that community. And so those were some of the programs that came out of, came out of that. <coughs> um, as, the, uh, as, as, as we lost a lot of people in terms of uh, being in prison and being incarcerated, uh, we began to uh, uh, change our, we, we realized we also had to change our tactics and, and look at other strategies. Um, George Jackson. George Jackson also was one of the great leaders of the Black Panther Party. I don't know if, too, if many of you know who George Jackson was, but George Jackson was one of the field marshals of the Black Panther Party. And uh, George was another one, one of those, those young people like uh, Fred Hampton. You know, he went to prison when he was 17 years old for uh, robbing a gas station. Uh, he was uh, sentenced of the indeterminate sentence. Back in the 60s, they had a law in California where they would charge you with it. They, would, they, they call it indeterminate sentence, which meant that uh, you may get five years, but they wouldn't have to let you out until they wanted to let you out. And so he went to, George Jackson went to prison. I believe it was, it, it started out as uh, two to five years. He never got out of prison. He never saw the, the light of, of, of day outside of prison. He died in prison at the age of 27, I believe it was. But George Jackson was one of those special human beings, one of those special individuals that taught himself and educated himself while he was in prison. He read everything. He read uh, Marxism. He read, uh, he read Mao. And, and he read other things that, that, that weren't necessarily Marxist-Leninism. And he began to realize what was going on in the prisons, that the prisons was a microcosm for what was happening in our society, that through the prisons, they were able to segregate people and keep other uh, inmates fighting against each other. They kept the white inmates and the black inmates and Latino inmates separated uh, from each other. They instigated, do, uh, instigated uh, uh, incidents so that they were constantly fighting and battling each other. But George Jackson saw that. He saw the folly in that. He began to reach out to uh, the white inmates. The, uh, he began to reach out to the Nazis, if you can believe that. He began to reach out to the Latinos and began to help them to understand that they were all victims of, of, of the judicial system. And uh, he began to, he, he, George Jackson was so significant that this movement began to spread all across the country, all across the country, that prisons all across the country began to organize and began to look at what was going on in prisons. And Fred and uh, George Jackson was somebody that they had to, had to kill. And uh, eventually, uh, in 1971, George Jackson was assassinated in prison, a year after his brother had been killed in Marin County. And his brother, Jonathan Jackson, had joined the Black Panther Party at 16 years old. And he was a member of the uh, Panther Underground. But J Jonathan loved his brother. He loved his brother. And he, he, he could see the greatness in his brother, George Jackson. And they wrote constantly back and forth. And so he wanted his brother free. And so Jonathan decided that he was going to break his brother out of prison. And so he put together a plan. Uh, and uh, he went down to the Marin County Courthouse uh, with the satchel of weapons and walked into the uh, courtroom, pulled out his guns and said, all right, everybody, up against the wall. And he armed the, uh, the other inmates that were in there that were uh, going to trial, and they took uh, a judge hostage, they took a, uh, several jurors hostage, and they took a uh, prosecutor hostage, and they taped a shotgun to the... Uh, um, to the judge's neck. And, they, and what they were asking for was the, uh, the release of George Jackson and a plane to take them to Cuba. And so they, they made it out of the courthouse and made it across the parking lot. They made it into the van. And as the van began to pull off, you would think that the, the, the judge's life or the prosecutor's life and, may, and the juror's life would have some meaning 
to the, uh, the fascist police, but it had no meaning to them because they opened up fire and they killed everybody in that van except for Rochelle McGee. And the prosecutor uh, was also spared, but he was uh, paralyzed for the rest of his life. So as, 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 as you can see that uh, we were really up against some, uh, some, some very vicious and very uh, crazy people uh, during that time period in the, uh, in the 60s. Uh, and uh, just as we are up, up against some real vicious and crazy people today. So the, the third phase of the Black Panther Party was we began to realize that uh, we, we needed to solidify our control and we needed to solidify our power. And so a, a, a strategy was uh, developed to uh, uh, bring all of the uh, best organizers, all of the best people to Oakland. And the strategy was to take over Oakland and make Oakland a liberated territory. And the first thing we did was begin to uh, run Bobby Seale for mayor of Oakland. And uh, we, we organized a campaign to put, we really weren't certain that we could win the mayorship, but what we were certain about that was that we would be able to organize and get people to understand that they had a right to participate in the, uh, in the, in the uh, political system. And so uh, we uh, opened up five campaign offices throughout Oakland. I don't know if any of you have been to Oakland, but Oakland's not that, not that big. But we had five campaign offices in Oakland. We had two of the best organizers in each of those community uh, offices. And we began to organize people, and we began to uh, register people to vote. And uh, we would put out 200 people out in the streets in one day just to register people to vote. We registered every single person in Oakland. At least that's what our goal was, to register every single person in Oakland to vote. <coughs> and uh, as the uh, campaign progressed, we also did, did some other things. We opened up uh, we, we were working on developing a uh, clothing factory and a shoe factory and, and several businesses. And uh, uh, we had party members in all, we infiltrated all the college campuses during that campaign because we understood that uh, students were extremely important in the movement and, and in this particular battle. And so we were organizing on all levels. We were organizing on the college campuses, we were organizing on the streets, we we're organizing in the pool halls. We we're organizing everywhere. And so uh, it came down to election day. We had vans. We had people going to people's houses, senior citizens, people who had never voted before. We were actually taking them to the polls, taking them out of their houses and walking them to the polls, transporting them to the polls. And we had Panthers and community workers standing all over uh, on, on the streets with uh, um, information about uh, Bobby Seale and Elaine Brown. And so uh, it, was, it was very surprising to us that we ended up in a runoff with, with the mayor. And we, we had no idea that we would be able to get out that many people to vote. And though we did not win, what happened was uh, people, other politicians, began to realize that we had a political machine that we had a, we could actually get out the vote and we could actually get people to support a certain candidate. So other candidates began to support us. And so it just so happened that Jerry Brown was running for governor. And Jerry Brown had been a, uh, during his uh, law school days, he had worked with the Black Panther Party. And so we began to cultivate that, uh, that uh, relationship with Jerry Brown. He came to us and asked to support his campaign. And lo and behold, Jerry Brown ended up in Sacramento. And this was a different Jerry Brown than the Jerry Brown is today. That Jerry Brown 30 years ago was, uh, 20 years ago, was, was a very idealistic person and w was really interested in really making some serious changes. And so uh, through uh, our relationship with Jerry Brown, we were able to get uh, uh, attorneys appointed uh, to be judges, and those attorneys knew why they, we actually selected these attorneys who ended up being judges. <coughs> and uh, the next move was to get somebody into the, uh, into, uh, the mayor's seat. And so we uh, selected uh, Lionel Wilson, who had been a former uh, 
gov uh, a former uh, judge uh, who was not very political, but, but that didn't really mean anything. And so we approached Lionel Wilson, told him we wanted him to be the next mayor of Oakland. He agreed, and so we ran his campaign, and he became the next mayor of Oakland. We actually, actually put him in, in the mayor's seat. And so uh, our relationship with, with Lionel Wilson at that time was that we were, we were pretty much running the city of Oakland. And uh, as, as, as our payback for putting him in that seat, he was going to appoint two Panthers to the uh, Port of Oakland, which was very significant because the Port of Oakland was the second largest containerized port in the uh, world. And it, was, it, it controlled a lot of the wealth of Oakland. And it also was a place where a lot of the drugs at that time was coming in. And so um, we were closer at that point. This was 76, 77. We had actually almost liberated Oakland. The Black Panther Party had basically almost taken control of almost Oakland. We, we, had, we, were controlled, we controlled City Hall. We controlled the judicial system. We had a private school that was one of the top private schools in the country. And it, it was so, it was so uh, influential that we were beginning to influence the, uh, the school system in Oakland. And so I, I guess the reason why I'm telling you this is that uh, it's important to understand that, that we have to have a broad concept of what we're trying to do. We have to have a broad concept of strategies. And we, we cannot take on the mentality of the victim, which awfully happens often happens with the left, that we often take on the position of, of, of the victim. You know, we see all these atrocities and all these horrible things going on around us and, you know, in, 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 in Palestine and on other places and, and we, we think about how, how horrible it is and, and, and we, we don't think that we have the power to change things. But we do have the power to change things. We have the power. When we used to say all power to the people, that really had significance. And the people really do have power because it was the people, particularly young people, that stopped the Vietnam War. I never will forget that. I never will forget those continuous demonstrations and all those thousands and thousands and millions of young people all across the country that continued to march on their college campuses and, and march in Washington, D.C. And uh, I, I remember here in Seattle when they marched on the freeway and stopped the traffic for free, uh, uh, on the freeway. That really shook them up. It really shook them up. And they, there were almost 200,000 people that marched on Washington, D.C. And Nixon could not, could not, uh, not pay attention to that. And it was the people, it was the power of the people that stopped the Vietnam War. We have the power. We have the power. <clears throat> and we have to understand that. But we also have to understand that we have to be sophisticated, that this is not just a short-range uh, battle. This is not just a short-range struggle. This is just not something you're going to be involved in for a couple of years. Because you've got to understand that, uh, that, you know, what are you going to be doing 10 years from now, 20 years from now, 30 years from now? You're probably going to have kids. You're probably going to raise a family. You're going to be doing other things that other people are doing. But the struggle doesn't stop there. It doesn't stop there. And we're talking about this is a battle to save the earth. This is the battle to save the world. But we got the most evilest administration in the White House that has ever existed, ever existed. And the, the, the environment is in peril. The ice caps are melting. Um, the, 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 the warmongering that's going on uh, with, that's coming out of Bush's mouth in terms of what he wants to do in, uh, in Iraq, what he's already done in Afghanistan, the thousands and thousands of people that have been killed from those bombs. I mean, it just blows me away that somebody can think that we're going to drop 50,000 bombs on some people, and we, we, we don't have any kind of feeling, any kind of concept of what those 50,000 bombs are going to do. You know, it's going to, it's, it killed thousands of people in, in, in Afghanistan. Not only did it kill thousands of people, but it destroyed the environment in Afghanistan. It destroyed the mountains and, and, and villages and, and everything. Now he wants to do the same thing in Iraq. And he's not going to stop in Iraq. He's not going to stop in Iraq. And he hasn't stopped in Iraq because the war on terrorism is affecting us now. It's affecting us now. And as I was speaking to someone earlier, 
it's not only that war that we have to stop, but we have a, a war here in America that we still haven't stopped. And that's the, the war on drugs. The war on drugs has had us put thousands and thousands of young people of color in prison all across this country. We got two million people in prison to this very, right now, we got two million people in prison. A lot of them, uh, a, a, a handful of them were, 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 were students that were just got caught up in something. You know, one day they were going to school, the next day they're looking at 50 years, 30 years, in prison for the rest of their life. A lot of young people, just like you, are sitting in prison for the rest of their lives because of the so-called war on drugs. There are communities back on the East Coast and in the South where so many young people have been arrested and put in prison, it's, it's changed the whole community. It's changed the whole community. I, I, I saw an article uh, about a year ago. It was talking about uh, how, uh, the fact that there were two million people in prison. And they talked about this one little community, this one small town, where there had been so many young people that had been taken off the streets and put in prison that it began to change the community. That for, they thought it would have a positive effect by putting all these young young people in prison, but it had a negative effect. Because now you got all these young kids growing up without a father. And you have these, these, these women, these mothers, growing up without a man, growing up without a husband, growing up without a loved one, and raising their families without a husband, and raising their families without a loved one. It's completely destroyed the, uh, the families. It's com completely destroyed the communities. So we got some serious work to do. But as I said earlier, we have to think long term. We can't just think short term. We can't just think about stopping this war. We have to think about ourselves too. You know, we got work to do with ourselves too, inside of ourselves. Because living in America, dealing with the oppression of America, Americanism and Western culture, and, and all the stuff that's happened to our families and all the stuff that's happened in the past and slavery and all that oppression, all that stuff is, is, is just follows us right through history and it's affected us. It affect, affects us how we treat one another. It affects us how we look upon one another. It affects us how, how we think about ourselves. And, and, and those things affect us as we, as we uh, participate in the movement. And so we have, to, we have to think about those types of things, too. We have to be, develop a human consciousness. We have to develop a consciousness that we say that we are in harmony with all living things on this earth, all living things on this earth. And we have to always remember that. We have to always read and always study and always grow and uh, always keep moving forward. Because we can change this, but the only way that we can change it is we got to change people's mind. Because we are in a very bad situation right now here in America because so many Americans have become doped up and blind to what is happening. That, that materialism, you know, that's been part of their plan. You know, dope the people up on TVs and VCRs and, and game boards and, and uh, all this other stuff that occupies our mind and occupies our time. And, you know, people are driving around their SUVs and... You know, they think they're safe, you know. They think they're secure. And that's what 9-11 was all about. You know, we completely missed the whole issue about 9-11. You know, what 9-11 was about was that this is one world, that we are all one part of the human race. That if one person is suffering in Palestine or Yugoslavia or Iraq or Iran or in Africa or wherever, South America, Brazil, if somebody is suffering, we're all eventually going to suffer. We're all eventually going to suffer. We all, and we must understand that. Americans must, you, all of you, I'm sure, understand that, but too many Americans do not understand that. Do not, do not understand that if somebody is in pain somewhere else across the world, that we are all in pain. That's what 9-11 was about. <laughs> and we had the opportunity. With 9-11, we had the opportunity. We had the opportunity to, to reflect and say, oh man, this is hell, this is horrible. We've lost thousands of people, and this was a horrible thing that happened. A lot of people died, a lot of people suffered. You know, the people who are living, who had relatives, they suffered. But what about the Palestinians? You know, what about the, the, the young Israeli kids who are victims 
of the suicide bombers? You know, what about the Palestinians who are victim of the uh, of the Israeli army that comes in there and destroys their homes and kills them and kills them at will? What about the thousands of kids in Africa that are dying of AIDS every single day? You got whole villages that don't have any parents and kids raising themselves, you know? You know, and, and this is going on all over the world. You got people suffering from all over the world. And so we as Americans, we, we must come to the realization that this is one world. Because if we don't, it's going to backfire. It's going to, it eventually it's going to affect us. And, and that's, where, that's where you young people come in because you are the young people of consciousness. You have the consciousness. And you, you do understand what is at stake. And so we have to make the rest of them understand what is at stake. <coughs> and as I said before, this is a long-term struggle. It's a long-term battle. You know? And I'm sure a lot of you will, will, will grow up and will move on and will, you'll have careers that you'll be involved in. Some of you may be doctors, some of you may be lawyers, some of you may be school teachers, some of you may just be parents. You know? Some of you may be firemen or whatever. But as long as you have that human <coughs> consciousness understanding with you, that's important. That's important because we need, uh, we need that in all aspects of our, of our civilization. We need more attorneys that are tuned into what we're talking about. We need more teachers that are tuned into what we're talking about. We need parents that are raising their kids on a conscious level to understand what we're talking about. And so I just, I just, I just want to say that um, the struggle continues, you know, and, 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 and our backs are against the wall. Just as we felt that our backs were against the wall as young people that joined the Black Panther Party, our backs are against the wall as young people in America. Our backs are against the wall. And we are, we, we are faced with uh, someone who is more treacherous than Richard Nixon could ever even think of being, you know. Uh, Bush is more treacherous. He, he makes uh, Nixon look like a Boy Scout. And uh, you know, what really worries me is that when the, when the, the election rolls around and, and the American people want to want to vote uh, Bush out of office, uh, I don't, really don't think he's going to give up that power. I don't think he's going to give it up that easy, you know. Um, we also have to understand that there's always, uh, when I was talking about uh, victim mentality, we also understand that, that there's a way of turning a negative into a positive. And that, that's what we did in the Black Panther Party lot. We turned a negative thing into a positive thing. And there was nothing that we thought that we felt that we could not overcome. We thought we could overcome everything. We used to say that we were, matter of fact, we got a slogan from North Korea because a lot of the leaders of the party traveled to different communist countries and they would bring stuff back. And, uh, they bought something back from uh, North Korea. It was a saying called Juche. And uh, Juche means uh, use what you got to get what you need, you know, by any means necessary. And we felt that we could, we always used to say that we were, one panther was equal to uh, nine of the enemies, you know, that we could outwork nine of them. One of us could outwork nine of them. And so we threw our, our life into, uh, into the struggle. <coughs> And so uh, we, have to, we have to understand that, uh, that we have the power, that we have the power. Um, so I, I think I'm going to end now. Uh, my time is up. I want to make sure I've touched on uh, everything. Um, and uh, let's stop this war. Let's stop this war, not, and let's stop the war against Iraq, but let's not stop there. We're going to stop that war. We're going to stop this drug war. We're going to stop the three strikes you're out. We're going to get all those people that have been locked up in all these prisons all across the country, we're going to get them released. We're going to get free so they can be out here on the streets with us. We're going to get those laws overturned that says if you are ex-felon, you cannot vote. That's crazy. That's insane. That should not be. We're going to change that shit. We're going to change America. All power to the people. No, they, they, they weren't just black. Matter of fact, here in, in Seattle, we had uh, Asians that were involved in the Black Panther Party. We had two Japanese uh, guys and a Filipino young man that we had gone to school with. And uh, <coughs> one of those young men just passed away, if I may 
mentioned that Guy Carosa. He was he was he was 14 years old when he joined the Black Panther Party. You know, young Japanese man. He was my best friend. He was he was an awesome man. Now in in, in Oakland, we had a a white lady who was a member of the Black Panther Party. So. Uh, no, the Black Panther Party was, just wasn't for black people, but, but one of the things we did was uh, begin to influence and organize other organizations, like in L.A., uh, they organized the Brown Berets, which was a Latino organization. Uh, back in the uh, East Coast, in the Midwest, there was an organization called the Young Patriot Party. It was headed up by a guy named Preacher Man. And these were young whites. These were young whites that were just like we were. You know, they were down for the struggle. The Young Patriot Party. The Young Patriot Party. Yes. A medical clinic, yes. A Carolyn Downs Medical Clinic, which is on Yesler. It's housed in the um, Odessa Brown Clinic. And Carolyn Brown, uh, uh, <coughs> Carolyn, uh, hmm, man. Carolyn Downs was a, a, a young woman that was a member of the Black Panther Party. And she passed away of cancer, and we named the clinic after her. Yes. Mr. Story, most of the history of the Black Panther Party that I've heard have usually ended in the 1970s and talk about basically make it look like you were defeated. Right. And it was really you know, a revelation to hear how you had continued and sort of rebuilt yourselves. Yeah. Are there any places where that's just sort of... Um, I guess been written out so people can access it? It really hasn't been written. It really hasn't been written out. And uh, that's because most of the books that have been written by, uh, about the Black Panther Party have been written about leaders, uh, by, by the leaders, like uh, um, e Elaine Brown and uh, David Hilliard. Um, but I, I just finished uh, writing a book, and it talks about, about that and about that time period when, when we had almost actually uh, created a liberated territory and how powerful that was. So, the, and, and another Panther who, was, who I, was, I was good friends with, he has also just finished a book. So there will be two books that will be coming out that will be talking more about that. Yes? Um, I was wondering if you could compare like COINTELPRO, like back then, if you know what's going on now to how um, the style of tactics that are used nowadays uh, of dis disinformation. And neutralization? Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, the Cointel Pro was devious. It was extremely devious because uh, the Cointel Pro was 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 basically to destroy the Black Panther Party, and they they did every single type of tactic. They they uh, messed with people's families. They messed with people's loved ones. They went on their jobs and got them fired from jobs and. Uh, they put out information about one person and another person, and they they caused dissension within the Black Panther Party because they created uh, a conflict between Elgis Cleaver and Huey Newton and Bobby Seale and Elgis Cleaver and Stokely Carmichael. So uh, somebody left a note in somebody's in Stokely Carmichael's uh, bodyguard's car that Stokely Carmichael was an FBI informant. So people began to. Uh, uh, be paranoid about Stokely Carmichael. And I think that's one of the things that I, that I think we really should be on guard on is, is that whole issue of being paranoid. And, uh, and I, I think, you know, when we, you know, the conspiracies, there's, there's a lot of conspiracy theories that are floating around, you know. And it's very easy to, to really start getting off in those conspiracy theories. Um, about uh, maybe five, six, seven, eight years ago. Any of you heard of the book called Pale White Horse? Oh, man. <laughs> I started reading that book. Me and a group of friends of mine, we all started, we heard about that book, and we all went out and got it, and we had study groups, and we were reading. We got a film that went with it, and oh, my God, man. <laughs> that, that book uh, created so much paranoia it, 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 it created a situation where we, and, and this is what uh, conspiracy theories do, is you, you know, you read all these conspiracy stuff and this and that and blah, blah, so-and-so is an agent, blah, blah. And what happens is you feel that you don't have any power. You feel that these people are so powerful, that they got so much power that they're doing this and they're doing that. What can we do? And it, it, it causes you not to be able to do anything. It causes you not to be able to move forward. 
And that's, that that's just shouldn't be the case. Because we used to say, and I still believe this, that the spirit of the people is stronger than the man's technology. We don't care how much technology and how much uh, phone taps they do. And now they really got some sophisticated shit now, boy. They got stuff. They can be listening to your conversation four or five blocks away, you know. Um, uh, <coughs> but what's happening now really is, is very insidious because... <clears throat> They're rounding up people in this country in, in silence. In Portland, Oregon, they arrested three young people. And uh, here in Seattle, uh, they arrested a young man named James Ujama. And James Ujama was very much like you guys are, a, a politically conscious human being and idealistic in many ways, just, the way, just like a lot of us we were in the Black Panther Party. Uh, somebody who probably could be a future leader in America, but right now he's sitting in jail and, and looking at being locked away for a long time. And so, uh, and, that, and, and they arrested him just on some hearsay. And so uh, you can rest assured that, uh, that, that they have an eye on people and that, and that, and that, that they are uh, listening and they're plotting and they're... they're they're planning, but we can't pay any attention to that. We can't dwell on that. We have to work, think about what we can do. You know, we have to think about what we have the potential to do and what's ahead of us and concentrate on what we got to do. And, and don't even worry about them because, as I said, uh, the spirit of the people is stronger than a man's technology. Any other questions? Yes. You know, one, one of the beautiful things about the Black Panther Party is that we all had the same uh, unity of will. We all had the same consciousness about what we wanted to do and what we had to do, you know. All across the country, we may have had the different chapters and branches, may have had different methods and different ways of doing things, but we all had the same plan. That was to change America, you know, to change America, make America a better place for all human beings. But we did have a lot of dissension in the party. We did have a lot of negative things going on in the party. And that's why I say it's important to understand that you have to work on yourself. And, we, and see, in the party, we didn't have time to do that. You know, uh, we, at least we felt we didn't have the time to do that. We were so uh, uh, absorbed with the external, the outside world in terms of what was going on and dealing with the police and working hard and dealing with these programs, we did not think about all of the oppression and all the baggage that we brought with us into the organization. And that's what destroyed the Black Panther Party. It wasn't the FBI and Jerry Gruber because we withstood all of their punches. We withstood their toughest punches. Everything they threw at us, we withstood that shit. Even though they killed 30 party members in a matter of uh, four years, and I went to 10 funerals. In 10 years, I went to 10 funerals. Even though they imprisoned almost 1,000 Panther leaders, we still withstood that. And we were still kicking butt. What destroyed the Black Panther Party was ourselves. And, and more importantly, what aided uh, in that uh, uh, destruction was the influx of drugs into uh, Oakland, California in 1972. And I was in Oakland at that time. Oakland was flooded with cocaine. And at that time, <coughs> Oak, cocaine was <coughs> considered a casual drug. Everybody was into snorting cocaine. Movie stars, politicians, everybody. So there were leaders of the Black Panther Party who had snorted cocaine just as I had been snorting cocaine. And we were already very paranoid and so that cocaine affected members of our leadership. <coughs> because we put our leadership on a pedestal, it made it difficult for us to, uh, to question them about what they were doing. And so eventually it, it led to the destruction of the Black Panther Party, which is why I tell you it's so important to work on yourself. You know, not that we got another thing going on outside of us, but we also got some stuff going on inside of us. And so we got to think about that. I just want to have an opportunity to uh, to acknowledge Mark Cook, young, the young man sitting over here. He's got a little gray hair, but he's still a young man. <laughs> Mark Cook was a member of the Black Panther Party in Walla Walla. He joined the Black Panther Party chapter in Walla Walla. He spent 17 years in prison. And Mark Cook came right out of prison. He came right out after doing them 17 years and got right back into the struggle. He is still just as dedicated today as he was 20, 30 years ago. I did. Uh, 
Um, any other questions? Uh, yeah, I have one. Yes. Well, uh, I, I think that uh, uh, I, I still call him H. Rap Brown. <laughs> That's what I remember him as, H. Rap Brown, because he was a member of the Black Panther Party. But he carried uh, all of this stuff that he were, we were doing in the party, he carried that back in, into his, uh, his life as a Muslim. And he began to organize in, uh, oh, that's okay, no, thank you. He began to organize uh, uh, his, in his community in, in um, Atlanta. And they had stopped the drug dealing in their community. They were doing a lot of very important political stuff in their community. And there's no doubt in my mind that they set, uh, they set him up. And uh, I, I think it's, it's, it's a wake-up call because someone I think the guy that, uh, one of the uh, guys who was doing the spoken word mentioned too that we have no more elders, that there are no elders, which is really very true, which is really true. Because what happened was uh, in the 70s, a lot of the, uh, the people that were in the Black Panther Party were either killed, imprisoned. A lot of us were, were so disillusioned that we just kind of drifted off and blended in. And, and what happened was so devastating to us because we did not achieve the victory that we wanted to achieve. That was so devastating to us the way that the Black Panther Party ended. We just wanted to just blend in and leave that shit behind and not even think about it. And, uh, and also what was happening then was uh, uh, the influx of drugs into America. Uh, a, lot of young, a lot of men were taken off the streets. A lot of men that were my age were taken off the streets and put in prison. And then you had the, uh, the gates of uh, Western culture opening up and uh, inviting all the minorities in and say, yeah, come on in, you can be just like us. And we ran through that door and we left all our strong cultural values behind, you know. All our strong cultural values, which was family first, community first, young people first, uh, give back, bring back the communities number one. Now in the 70s, what became most important was the individual, was self, was uh, 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 having uh, all of the trappings of success. And we left all our cultural values behind. So young people were left alone to raise themselves and take care of themselves. That's what the hip hop movement grew out of. It was the absence of adults. It was the absence of the elders that young people raised themselves and began to come up with their own ideas of how to combat this oppression that they're dealing with. And so now I think a lot of us who were involved in the movement back then are realizing now that, 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 that the movement is not over, that we got to step up. We got to come on back and we got to give our young people some, some guidance and some direction because we had guidance and direction. And so it's important that we come back and do that too. So um, uh, I guess I got a little bit off the track. <laughs> But, uh, but, but he's a very important man. That's why they locked him up. That's why they put him in prison and, and, and put those trumped up charges on him. Uh, there was another question. Somebody had a question? Yes. Oh, she, she wanted to know, before I was mar marching with Martin Luther King and nonviolent, then bam, a year later, five years later, I was a Black Panther Party carrying shotguns and rifles and stuff. Why did I convert that? And I, I guess uh, probably the first thing is, is that uh, we got to look at American history. America is the most violent country on the face of this earth. America was created through violence, vi un un unspeakable violence on the native people. I mean, man, there were 50 million Native Americans in North and South America when Columbus came over here. And uh, that has been whittled down to probably about 10 to 20 million. Uh, not to mention what happened in slavery, the, the, the uh, uh, tragedy of slavery and imprisoning so many people and the fact that there are 26 million people that died just on the way coming over here, on the way coming over here, you know? And so America is a violent, violent country. I grew up watching John Wayne. Mark will tell you, when we grew up watching TV, all, uh, most of the stuff we saw on TV was uh, war movies, war movies. And, and for Christmas, we got machine guns for Christmas, plastic machine guns for Christmas. Everybody had a cap gun, everybody had BB guns. And so guns was a very much a part of America. And so when Martin Luther King was killed, a man who was as, 
as, as peaceful and nonviolent he was, it was very easy for us to understand that we, we need to try something else, you know, that, that, we, that we need to defend ourselves and we need to pick up some guns and, 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 and do this, you know, do what we had to do. Plus, we were young. When you're young, you just don't really don't care, you know. And so I hope that answered your question. Uh, somebody else? Did you? Have, oh, you had a question. In, oh no, heck no. <laughs> no, we weren't. Uh, we weren't one of the largest chapters, but we were. We were one of the most potent chapters. We were. We were a very good chapter. We had some good organizers. We had some really good people. And I, I think it had a lot to do with Seattle, the Seattle community as a whole, and a lot of the support that we got in Seattle. We got a tremendous amount of support because when I was talking about Fred Hampton, and they went to raid Fred Hampton to kill him, see, the, uh, uh, J. Edgar Hoover put out a memo uh, early 69. The memo was, he sent it to all the FBI officers. He wanted three chapters destroyed, the Chicago chapter, the L.A. Ch chapter, and the Seattle chapter. And after they went to Chicago, and they went to L.A., then they, ATF came straight up to Seattle. And they went to the mayor's office. They said, we got word that the uh, Panthers got some illegal weapons in there. And so we want to raid their office. And luckily, Mayor Wes Ullman said, my informant tells me they don't have no illegal weapons. Therefore, I'm not going to let you go in there and kill them. And so he, he actually told them, that if you go to raid the Seattle office, I'm going to send the Seattle Police Department up there. Now we had, we had, uh, we were so well known in the Seattle community. We had five breakfast programs going on. We had a, a free medical clinic. We had the first food bank program going on. We had a free busing program. We were very well known to everybody. So Mayor, Mayor Wes Oman understood that if he allowed them to come there and kill us like they did Fred Hampton, that he would not be able to live with himself and that his political career would be over. And so he stepped forward. And so uh, we had a lot of support from the Japanese community. I, I, I couldn't understand why so many older Japanese were supporting the Black Panther Party. And it, 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 later on, it hit me that a lot of those Japanese had been in the internment camps. And they, they understood what oppression was about. And, uh, and so they, they, they stepped forward and supported the Black Panther Party quite a bit. Yes. Uh, yeah, yeah, definitely, because um, as, as we began to move forward, we, you know, we realized that we were about organizing, and it didn't matter who it was that we organized, organized with. And a lot of, a lot of people did not support our uh, violent, uh, our, our usage of weapons, and that was okay. That was okay, you know. But they supported a lot of other things that we did. They, so they worked in our breakfast program. Maybe they weren't willing to carry a gun, but they were willing to fry some eggs, you know. Um, so yeah, we, we were, we, and that, that's why we were so successful, because we worked with uh, a lot of different people, a lot of different organizations. We worked with the, uh, the people that were fighting against the war. Well, I, I think, in, you know, back in the 60s, there were a lot of revolutionary movements going on. There were revolutionary movements going on in South America, in Africa, uh, Vietnam, and uh, we never would have thought about doing anything where uh, civilians would be harmed, would be, would be killed. Um, but things have changed so much. America, uh, the American government has never, th never thought twice about harming civilians. And uh, the level that, 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 that the oppression has, has gotten around the world, uh, uh, you, now you see revolutionary organizations that are, are using violence to the extent that it does harm, uh, th that civilians are, are caught up in it. And that's a result of, of, of a, a Western dominant American culture. It's a result of that. Uh, Palestinians have been watching their families and their kids being killed uh, for years and years and years and years. And it wasn't just until Recently, they, be, they began to use the suicide bomber, you know, because they felt, well, hey, our civilians are being killed, that we need to take it home to them. We need to let them feel the pain. We need to let them understand that our families are suffering when we lose someone. Okay, now 
you're going to lose someone too. And let's see how you feel about that. So I, I, don't, I don't condone uh, uh, the, the, the use of um, violence to hurt innocent people. But I do understand that that type of uh, tactic, that type of warfare is a result of uh, American Western cultural dominance. Now, I, I, I personally think that another tactic would be more effective, you know, not harming uh, innocent people would, would be much more effective, but uh, that's, that's just my, my perspective. Um, did that answer, answer your question somewhat? Well, uh, you know, as I, I think that there's, there's a lot more to it. Than, than what happened on 9-11. You know, I, I, uh, I, there, there definitely is a lot more to it. And um, um, those young men uh, who sacrificed their lives, uh, <coughs> they wanted to bring it home to America because they have seen, you know, what America has done. You know, America, I mean, just look at the history of America. And, and they know the history of America. They know uh, what Americans have done in terms of carving up the world. You know, after World War II, India was carved up and, you know, they, that's, that's how Pakistan was created, you know, because they carved that up. How arrogant is that? You know, they, they did that to Vietnam after World War II. You know, uh, they told the French they could have South Vietnam and, and, uh, and, and, uh, Cambodia, they did the same thing, and, and Laos, they did the same thing. And so 9-11 and what happened is not separate from the history of the world. You know, it's, it's not separate from that. And what happened on 9-11 is a result of everything that has happened in the past. All that has brought us to the present, to where we are right now. And did that, is that explaining it? Are you sure? Well, I, I think it did shake up America, and I think they did uh, pretty much bring imperialism, uh, because we're still feeling the effects of it. We're still feeling that. Um, and it's woken up a lot of people. I think a lot of people had a positive response to what happened in 90. I think a lot of people really began to wake up and really began to tune in to the suffering that other people are having, you know? And all this stuff that we're hearing in the media is a lot of it is just hype. And I, I think that, uh, I think people are waking up. And, and we, we wouldn't be here today talking. I wouldn't be here now talking to you. You wouldn't be here organizing against a, the war. Um, I was at, uh, I, there's a gas station that I go to up on Madison uh, quite a bit, and there's an older white guy in there. He must have been about his 70s. We always talk politics and stuff. And last time I saw him, he said, uh, I said, man, what, what do you think about Bush? Oh, man, I'm just so glad. I'm just so happy he keeps doing it. He just, just, I, just let him keep on doing it. And what he was saying was, was that Bush is raising the consciousness of a lot of people, that Bush is waking up a lot of people, you know? <laughs> and I mean, just think about it. Think about how sleep we were before Bush stole the elections and before 9-11. Think how complacent we were as a people. And, but we aren't, we aren't that way now, and we're moving away from that. So the more damage that Bush does, the more people that are, are waking up. And that's throughout the whole world, not just here, throughout the whole world. We just had a leftist elected to Brazil, the first leftist in a, in a large South American country. That is a tremendous victory, tremendous victory. And I don't think that couldn't happen if 9-11 hadn't happened. Because I think the Brazilian people were so fed up with the arrogance of American people that they said, we're going to elect this man irregardless of the fact. And, and the more that our administration uh, put pressure on Brazil not to elect him, the more the Brazilian people said, yeah, we are going to elect him. And so uh, that, was a re that, that was an effect right there. One last question. OK, one last question. Uh, well, the, the, I, I, I guess the first, comp the first thing was uh, in Oakland, California, when uh, the Panthers uh, were trying to get a stoplight uh, put up, and they wouldn't put a stoplight, so they went out there and directed traffic themselves with their shotguns. <laughs> 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 
And so they, they eventually put a stoplight up. Uh, I guess the second thing is, is the death of Denzel Dow, you know, in the black community there's always uh, a black man or in the Chicano community there's always an innocent black person getting killed. Well, Denzel Dow, a young man, 17 years old, was killed in Richmond, California. And so the Black Panther Party went out there to investigate. They went out there with their rifles and their shotguns. They cordoned off the whole area and they investigated it themselves. They called a rally. They marched down to the uh, police department with their rifles and shotguns and presented the evidence and presented the facts that they had. <coughs> and so it was those type of tactics that were some of the first uh, uh, important tactics of the Black Panther Party. You know, and then of course the, 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 the breakfast programs and all the survival programs. But also, you know, one of the most significant things about the Black Panther Party also was that we were in between the communities and the government. That there was nothing that they could put over on the people that we would not, we would be there to alert the people and to stop it every time, every single time. And we were the buffer. We, and as long as we were around, they could not get anything over on the people. That is why uh, when the Black Panther Party ceased to exist because when the, during, the, during the era of the Black Panther Party, the gang warfare in America stopped. There were no gang warfare going on during the era of the Black Panther Party. Now before that there was, but not during the Black Panther Party. When the Black Panther Party died out in 1978, then that's when the Crips and the Bloods began to uh, uh, percolate, began to start doing things that they were doing. That's when cocaine, crack cocaine, rock cocaine was flooded into America. Now that could not have happened if the Black Panther Party had been, been there, been around. But with, with the elimination of the Black Panther Party, they were able to uh, create this uh, crack cocaine gang epidemic that led to the imprisonment of thousands and thousands of young people all across the country, which nullified, in many respects, the power uh, and the strength that a lot of young people bring to the streets. Um, and so I just want to thank you, thank everybody, and continue the struggle.